My clock just turned to nine o'clock. So I'm going to turn it over to our first session, um, which is we're going to be hearing from Emily Van Howling, Lanre Ol Olanian, Muri sorry, Muriel Cote, Donia Zikri, Swarup Duta, and Nathan, whose last name I forgot to write down, um, but he'll introduce himself. And they're gonna be talking about decolonizing strategies and challenges in five Masters of Development programs. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Thank you for being here. I know it's early for some of us and very late for others. I'm especially happy to see my whole team here. <laughs> it's hard coordinating across so many time zones. Um, so first, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who we are as a group, and then I'll have um, each program person introduce themselves separately. So we came together as a group, um, a smaller unit of us, for the International Conference on Sustainable Development, and we presented on decolonization there. And thought that there was a lot more that we wanted to follow up with, and we kept these conversations going. We brought in our group through the MDP network. So that for the past few months, we've been having semi-regular conversations about specific themes on decolonization. And today we're just gonna kind of share those themes with you. And we've been developing these through conversations also through a, a shared Google Doc that we've been reflecting together on. Um, so the five universities we have here, we have, um, Lund University in Sweden, Ibadan University in Nigeria, Terry University in um, India, and then University of Minnesota and Regis University in um, the United States. And we hope to really contribute a global perspective to this conversation. And through our conversations, we've realized we have a lot of commonalities in terms of practices and discourses and challenges. But there's also a lot of areas where we have very unique trajectories, you know, based on our particular positionings of our university, the history of our, of our countries, and um, our, our own identity and how that plays together. So we'll be sharing some of that with you. The three themes that we'll be talking about in terms of strategies for decolonizing are around decolonizing the curriculum, the field experience, and then tools and methods we use in the classroom. And then the last bit of the presentation, we'll talk about challenges that we've had in that process. <clears throat> so I'll introduce myself and then turn it over to my team for the same. Um, I'm an assistant professor in a master's of development program at Regis University, that's in Denver, Colorado. And we've been thinking about decolonization for the past um, four or five years and doing some research on it as well. Um, and our student body that we bring together is really global because we've been using uh, a synchronous Zoom classroom even before COVID. So it's given us a kind of a unique lens into some of these challenges. I'll turn it over to Lund University, maybe Muriel first. Sure, thanks a lot, Emily. Um, and uh, again, hi, everybody. Um, and thank you, Emily, also for bringing us at least me here, uh, because I, I wouldn't have ended up in this wonderful room of people without you. So thanks a lot uh, for that. So there are three of us, um, Katja, maybe you can wave, yeah, and Donia <laughs> from Lund University. And we're representing or we're going to speak from a program called LUMID. Maybe I can ask Katja or Donia to send the link of LUMID in the chat in case anybody, thanks. And um, myself, I'm the director of the program. Uh, it's a, a development, master in development studies and in management. So maybe the other thing that I would add also to Emily's introduction is that we're all part of a, a global consortium called Masters in Development Practice. And, uh, and so we, we came together through that. And I think from my part is we're, we're also maybe trying to get our heads around what does a decolonizing 
approach to development look like also when it's about practice it's not just about the theory of development but for an applied education what are the additional challenges or opportunities um, so at least for me that's that's what I find interesting I started directing the program in 2020 so I'm very new to the job it includes about maybe 50 faculty members total uh, 80 students in any one time um, and I'm very new, so that's also why I'm very grateful that we have Katja Gregorati, who's been uh, teaching on the program for, what did I write down, 12 years, and uh, supervising students as well. And we're also uh, quite lucky to have Donia, who's been a, a student on the LUMID program in 2019-2021. So we're all kind of getting our heads together around decolonizing, which is not the norm in the program um, and is very fragmented so this is also kind of what we're contributing here and i'll, I'll pass the button to uh, maybe swarup hi hi good morning everyone so myself uh, i'm from uh, india and i'm in Perry school of Advanced studies new delhi and i'm assistant professor in the uh, School of Advanced Studies in the Department of Policy Studies and Management. And I am the program coordinator of uh, MA in Sustainable Development Practice, which is largely under the Global NDP program. And we are currently doing our program review and uh, I'm heading the team. And I have uh, rural 10 faculty members along with uh, all, all, almost 50 students. Uh, it varies in you know, 40 to 50 students almost. So, and we have uh, uh, exposure of a lot of international students from across the world. And uh, currently we are, as I mentioned, the country we are doing, uh, you know, program reviews. So I will share my experience with you, what kind of problems that we face, what, uh, what we are doing currently, and our thought process, our ideas of doing this review process, uh, which is essentially uh, uh, on the colonial pedagogical system. So we'll share, I will share my experience with you. Yep. Thank you. So I will request uh, now Landry to, uh, to just introduce ourselves. Landry. Okay, thank you very much, Swero. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this meeting. I uh, also want to start by thanking Emily for bringing all of us together and for coordinating this very well. Uh, I come from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, uh, which is one of the uh, one, one of the universities within the MDP Global Consortium. Uh, the MDP Masters in Development Practice uh, started in 2010, and uh, I have been involved with the MDP since 2010, uh, and later became the, the director of the program and I left as director of the MDP program in Ibadan uh, in December. Uh, but we started this before, uh, before I left, and I'm glad to be associated with this issue of decolonization. The colonization issue is one of the things that have been agitating the minds of many people within the university at Ibadan, and how to include them into the curriculum. And we have asked snippets of including them into some of the things that we do and how we do them. The Masters in Development Practice Program of the University of Ibadan has on the average in the last few years between 50 and 60 students. And it's a two year program, just like every other Masters in Development Practice Program. But because of its multidisciplinary nature and trying to look out of the box, uh, rather than being focusing on receipt theory, uh, we engage faculties from all kinds of discipline. And there are about 70 faculty members teaching on the program, bringing different perspectives. And this is one of the strengths uh, that we find in the program, which makes the colonization an issue that we have been focusing on. It's a pleasure to be here. And we are, will also be sharing some of the experiences that we have from the University of Ibadan as we move on. Thank you. Uh, and I'm Nathan, uh, I'm from the University of Minnesota and I am a current student. Um, so part of my joy in participating in this was 
um, thinking about a student perspectives on a lot of these conversations that so often are led primarily by faculty and staff, um, at least at the University of Minnesota. And so I was very excited um, for the opportunity to work with the team on this and to think creatively about some of the ways that we can think about decolonizing um, some of the pedagogy within the Masters of Development program. Um, and I will put a look, link to the U of M program. Thanks, Nathan and everybody. Um, just as a reminder how we're gonna structure this, we're gonna talk about three themes that have all emerged as really important areas for us in our decolonization journey. So the first is decolonizing curriculum, then field experience, then methods and tools and pedagogies we use in the classroom. So just to introduce this idea of decolonizing curriculum, I know it's um, also been a theme through this conference so far, but thinking about ways that we've um, done this in terms of class topics, syllabi, reading, learning outcomes um, throughout, throughout the curriculum, thinking about that being very broad. So for each of these, we'll have a couple people respond. And for this one, we'll have um, Katya, Swarup, and then myself. If you'd like to get us started, Katya. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me to this fantastic event. So I have very little time available. And I just wanted to give you a brief uh, overview of how our decolonizing journey started, what we managed to achieve tentatively, tentatively but also uh, what lies ahead for us as a program. So when reflecting back about how it all started, um, I think that it's fair to say that probably our journey began quite accidentally. Uh, we started more or less in 2018 when LUMIT's former director of studies, Srilata Sirka, um, now a lecturer at King's College London, and I were given the task to restructure the first course in the program. And this first course is called Development Studies Perspective. And as part of this process, we created an introductory module intending to really emplace development within colonial history, but also intending to expose students to um, a more grounded understanding of both mainstream and especially critical theories in development. And in the same year, Gurminder Bambra came to visit our university to talk about her new book, which she published in 2018, which was called which is called Decolonizing the University, and gave us a great deal of confidence in the decolonizing journey that we were about to commence. But a second big catalyst was the LUMIT class of 2019, and Donia actually belongs to this class. It was a fantastic cohort, but it was also a class that generated a lot of productive conflicts in terms of the identity and pedagogical offering of the program. So in very broad strokes, there were students that wanted more management and problem solving tools and others that critique the program for being too Eurocentric and for reproducing the Western gaze. Quite unashamedly, I took sides and together with a third of the class, we created an extracurricular series of gatherings, uh, which back then we called Decolonized Lumit. And as part of these meetings, we carefully studied the program syllabi, and the syllabi in Sweden are actually important legal documents, which is important, something important to, to state because we cannot really change anything unless we change the syllabus. And we reflected on the institutional structure that we could use to decolonize the program. And we also shared and discussed a, a number of readings. And Donia, please um, feel free to chip in, but I think that a particularly powerful resource that uh, we used during our meetings was an edited book by Sarah de Jong, uh, Rosal Baikaza, and Olivia Rutasiva called Decolonization and Feminism in Global Teaching and Learning. And I think that collectively, uh, we did manage to decolonize a little bit uh, the reading list of the first course in the program. I think that looking back at the reading list of this first course, I think it's fair to say that it is a slightly less Western centric. It is slightly more gender equal and attempts to give a visibility also to uh, younger non-Western authors. 
And I think that in hindsight, this was possible because uh, the incoming director of studies, and here I'm talking about Muriel, was very sympathetic to the call of decolonizing LUMID and actively encouraged all teachers in the course to pay much more attention to which authors and knowledge we were making visible and sharing with the students. There are rather a number of challenges that we keep on uh, going back to and reflect on. The first challenge is that uh, we are fearing the risk of uh, tokenism, namely uh, our fear is that we're simply adding a few known Western authors here and there without sufficiently sh shaking and challenging uh, the dominant development of BST. And the second challenge is that efforts to decolonize our syllabi are spearheaded by a handful of teachers. And relatedly to the second challenge, uh, I think that we've noted some resistance from colleagues in the course and in the program at large, for whom decoloniality is just one development perspective amongst others. But ironically, what's really helping uh, our journey forward is a powerful but also thoroughly neoliberal tool an external evaluation that was conducted uh, last year. And in this external evaluation, actually, reviewers uh, advised uh, very strong, strongly for the inclusion of more voices from the Global South. And this is all I wanted to share, and I'll pass it over to Swaroop. Hello. Hi. So uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you, Kesha, for your uh, uh, for your very important understanding on uh, decoloniality in the course curriculum. But in India, we have a very different perspective of it because we have a colonial past and we have the education system, which is very much colonial. So I will give it in nutshell, in two minutes, I will try to explain you what exactly we're trying to do. So we have a very interdisciplinary approach, uh, our MASDP program where we uh, introduce health science, social science, and management science. But uh, at the same time, our, our curriculum design is most importantly, uh, you know, leads towards uh, more of a decolonial syllabi. So uh, we have a course on uh, perspective of development in the semester one, where we talk about imperialism, we talk about colonialism and post-colonialism, which have sufficiently been covered along the conceptualization of inequality, marginalized rural urban divide, caste, class, and gender challenges uh, of indigenous uh, communities in India and so on. Now, coming to uh, our another uh, course, like uh, the key concepts of cultural and political ecology, uh, law and justice in the globalizing world, development theories and practices. So all these courses actually help the students to understand and assess and underline the factors of uh, various developmental challenges. Uh, faced by the communities while going to a month-long field work in the semester two and subsequently in the minor and major project internship in semester three and four. So we are ideally trying to uh, give them a background of uh, the community's perspective of development as well as how the theory can be translated into the practice. Now, third point is uh, reading and learning things, which is, I think, one of the most important, what Kashi is also trying to point out. We are also facing the same problem because our colleagues sometimes and our, uh, in a political scenario in the country and or sometimes, uh, you know, socioeconomic situations uh, of the, the countries uh, and which, which will actually help us uh, actually to understand the uh, you know, what are the current, uh, you know, course curriculum will be, say, for example, we have, uh, you know, na national education policy, which is ideally uh, a decolonial uh, development perspective, but at the same time, they are largely westernized. So this is a lot of paradox over here. So I will share you one uh, more point that is uh, a constant update of the reading list that we always do. And in this section, for example, in my, uh, my course on political ecology, I purposefully raise the political debate on environmental challenges by choosing various case studies from the developing nations. The students actually critically review those case studies and subsequently present it in the open debate and discussion. So they are also oriented uh, with the concepts of regional political ecology, feminist political ecology, and uh, uh, and the work uh, and the uh, work of the scholars like. Uh, Bandana Shiva's Violence of Green Revolution, Nandini Sundar's Burning the Forest, India's War on Bastar, 
or Binagarwal's Gender and Green Governance, you know. So these kind of books I used to give to the students so that they are largely oriented with the, the ongoing, uh, you know, uh, controversies over the, in the development uh, practices. And this current reading list has been updated with the existing dominant discourse, which largely rely on neo-Malthusian principles and where we blame the poor make the poor land. So here, the students are oriented both dominant and populist discourse. So uh, I think uh, we have uh, uh, another problem with is that uh, during the course curriculum development, we found that we are, uh, our all faculty members, when we discuss the issues, uh, we always try to talk about the market. So how is the market demand? How the students will be get oriented? Because we need to have a kind of uh, course where the student will be actually uh, uh, getting the jobs. And uh, so, so that's the kind of challenges that we are facing currently, that the student, one way we are getting, trying to student get into the job and then we are trying to make them in the decolonial perspective. So now the challenge is that we have to actually make a balance between these two, how the student will get one way they can understand the decoloniality, decolonialism and decolonial perspective. And at the same time, they also get into the job at the, uh, at the end of the day, because they are asking the question repeatedly to us that what is the curriculum development is market oriented or not. So that's a challenge that we face in during the development process. Yeah, so thank you. So th that's all from my side. Emily. Thank you. I, I love whenever we have these conversations, it's, it makes me reflect on what we're doing and I hear new things from everybody. That's been one of the benefits of these discussions we've been having. Something I'd just like to add, I think speaks to some of the challenges that both of you have brought up is when you have a lot of people teaching in your program, and in our program, we have a lot of affiliates um, who you know aren't paid very well, don't, aren't um, integrated into the larger university system in the same way. Um, it's hard to get that buy-in or that even that basic knowledge of what decolonization means and to get all the, all the instructors to bring it into their classroom. Um, so one thing that we've tried to do to address that is we have a two-day workshop where we bring all our um, faculty together, including our affiliates, and we, we talk together, we discuss about what we envision for decolonization in our program. And we give um, faculty the, the time to look at their syllabus with some guidelines for evaluating the types of readings and assignments they have. One thing that we found too is just not focusing so much or focusing on the identity of the author, but in addition, the perspective they contribute. Is it reinforcing um, the dominant narrative or is it providing an alternative just as another way of evaluating that reading list? So those are just some small strategies that we've used. Um, in the sake of time, I'd like to move on to the next topic, which is about field experience, something critical, I think, to most programs, but especially the MDP programs that are so focused on practice. How do we prepare students to be good development practitioners? And then how do we make that experience? Um, how do we fit it within this decolonizing paradigm? Mm -hmm. So the lineup for this one is Swarup, Lanre, and then Katya and Danya. Yeah, so again, uh, as I mentioned that the MA in Sustainable Development Practice Program in Terry School of Advanced Studies in New Delhi, we are actually uh, uh, the program where we a lot of focus on the field experience. So I'm going to share my own course curriculum where I, we have actually uh, I, you know, uh, used the field experience as one of our uh, main major course uh, in, the, in the entire uh, you know, MSDB program. So the popularity of the MSDB program is due to the uh, practice-oriented curriculum. The main attraction of this is a community needs assessment or what we call the group practicum. It was one of the foundational course which enables the students to engage with the local communities, preferably with the indigenous or non-indigenous communities in the remotest part of the country. Through their rigorous field work, the students are exposed to different realities that promote community engagement and to help them to understand the importance of working with the local population. Now, the course actually mandates the independent research. It's, it's in various groups that, for example, tomorrow my students are going to the field work, tomorrow morning for next one month. So the course actually mandates independent research by formulating research design, 
collecting and analyzing the data from the field. And we call it as a grassroots engagement. And through this grassroots engagement, the students get an opportunity to stay with the community at least 20 to 20, 30 days, where they identify and prioritize the local needs and eventually design and development interventions in a participatory mode. So they exclusively employ participatory tools like participatory rural appraisal, appreciative inquiry, problem and situation analysis, objective analysis, logical framework analysis, et cetera, while exploring various social, economic, and political environmental challenges that communities actually face regularly. Now, to understand the role of that development organization at the local level, the students actually associate with the local organization. Actually, that helps them to collect the data and to know the population uh, because in a group of students, say four or five students is to go. So they would uh, be there with the local uh, uh, development organizations who are working there. They will be associated with them and they will conduct their studies. So uh, as a, for, uh, for example, I can give you one uh, uh, just uh, before uh, uh, pandemic, uh, you know, in 2019, uh, and, uh, you know, we conducted one field work. So almost eight groups were there in different parts of the country. So one group, for example, they have uh, visited a village called Bona in Dindori district of Madhya Pradesh, that is a central Indian state. And they worked with the community called Baiga, that is an uh, indigenous community, and what, which also a kind of uh, community with what we called the particularly vulnerable tribal groups or the primitive tribal groups who were traditionally engaged with the shifting cultivations. Now, findings of the study actually highlighted some of the concerns like agricultural productivity and so on. But the, <coughs> and the, at the end of the uh, 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 you know, field work, they came up with the suggestions and this suggestion was actually reflection of what they actually feel about the community's uh, engagement with the government. What are the problems that communities faced so far? And what is the needs and the local needs of the, uh, the area? And accordingly, they actually propose uh, uh, some kind of uh, reflections uh, to the local uh, uh, municipality or local uh, panchayats that we call the local village council, and they submit a report to them. So in that way, students start a kind of grassroots engagements. So this is uh, my part of uh, experience uh, in Teddy School of Advanced Studies. Now, I request my other colleagues to join in and talk about more on their experience. Say, I think Landry is there. Yes, Emily? Yeah. All right. Uh, so Landry. Yes, I'm around. Um, I thank you very much for that introduction. And because all of us are running fairly similar curriculum in the Master's in Development Practice Program, uh, I think our field practice regime uh, are similar to uh, at Ibadan. We also have the field work uh, as part of the student's practicum, and that is a compulsory course for all the students to take. Uh, the different approach that we use is that during the course of our curriculum, uh, the first 12 months is spent using, uh, is spent on classroom uh, and theoretical understanding. So we take theory courses in the first year, and the second year is used for the practice, uh, the practicals, which includes this field work. Uh, the field work are divided into two parts. Uh, we have the internship, uh, where we try to, the students are engaged in a particular organization uh, for about three to six months. Uh, but that essentially it does not give us the level of decolonization in thoughts and practice that we would have required. So what's happened is that we have a feed experience. Uh, we call it local and global feed experience, where our students are also put into different groups and they go to communities, uh, local communities. Uh, there are two types, two variations in this feed work. One is that they go to, they go for feed work within Nigeria. And that's for two weeks, uh, 14 days. And they also had additional uh, three weeks outside Nigeria. The process of doing this is to try and make them understand that the theory is different from the practice. 
And in the order to understand the practice effectively, then they need to decolonize their mind uh, from the received theory that formed the basis of what they were taught in classes. The local field trip, uh, for each of these field trips, uh, we add a theme. There's always a theme that is understand the students use the first six weeks to do literature review, understanding the theory, understanding what the literature says about that particular theme. And then after that, we divide them into group of between eight and 10, and they go to different uh, localities within Nigeria first uh, to understand what, whether what is on ground is reflective of what uh, is actually in the theory. Uh, and when they come, it's like a mini research, a, a rapid research kind of a thing. They write their reports to triangulate whether what they find on the field is actually reflective of what they were taught as per theory in class. Then after that, they then go on what we call a global field trip, which is outside Nigeria now. So that gives them the opportunity of comparing the situation that they find in Nigeria with the situation that exists in another country and then compare those two realities that you find on ground with the theory that you were taught in class. And the idea is to be able to say that development does not reside in a particular place. They have to open their mind to realize that development context could be uh, peculiar to certain situations, but then there are also uh, areas in which there are uh, synergies among all these, so that they will understand that they will be able to decolonize their mind about saying that this is a strict jacketed thing when we talk about uh, development. So that's the way we run our field trip. And at the end of the day, we realize that the students come back uh, with a lot of experience, with a lot of understanding, with a lot of broad mandate way of looking at issues of development. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Katya and Donia? Thank you. So I'll be very, very brief because I have to share my time with Donia and you already heard already a little bit from me. So I'm going to share a few reflections based on the perspective of, of a teacher in the research methods course, but also from the perspective of someone who supervises students who do uh, field trips and field research. And I think it's important maybe for you to know that in our program, the responsibility to uh, find and organize internships and field work rests entirely with the students. So we don't have uh, uh, set partnerships or set uh, field trips for our students. They have to organize that themselves. Um, but I still believe that we are trying, albeit tentatively, to decolonize the uh, field work in three ways, through methods training, via collaborations with our librarian and in our advisory role. So our fieldwork training is quite uh, extensive and I think that important decolonial components of this include uh, lectures on research ethics and we teach ethics uh, beyond formal ethical procedures but actually we, we discuss the way in which uh, power relations uh, run through the research process as a whole. So from conceiving a research idea up to writing up um, a research project. Then last year, a fantastic uh, colleague of ours who's new to the research methods course introduced uh, um, uh, uh, discussions and lectures on decolonial research methodology. And for a long time in the program, we've also uh, offered an element of a uh, participatory action research through videos. And the second uh, way in which we attempt to instill um, decolonial sensibilities to students going uh, to the field is by engaging with our librarians. So there has been a massive interest in engaging with scholarly research in languages other than English. And we've organized dedicated workshops on information literacy with our librarians. And librarians have been a phenomenal in terms of pointing out to students uh, what university-owned databases could be helpful for this research, but also to public research repositories uh, uh, to retrieve uh, sources uh, written in languages other than English. And here I'm thinking about um, uh, ResearchGate and academia.edu. Uh, uh, 
And last, from a supervisor perspective, I think that especially prior to the pandemic, when our students used to do a lot of place-based field work, meant there was a consensus amongst the supervision group. Um, we've consistently encouraged our students, for example, to meet with local academics, visit local libraries and archives. And from my situated perspective, what was really interesting to observe is that through these uh, encounters and engagements, uh, students often brought back resources to Lund or requested our librarians to purchase uh, um, particular books uh, uh, that would not otherwise have been available. So I think that intentionally uh, or unintentionally, this practice has helped us to decolonize our library a little bit. Over to you, Donia. Yes, thank you very much, Katya. I will also quickly bring in um, a bit of a student perspective and highlight a few things about his work, um, yeah, which is an essential element of the program, especially in the second year. So in my class, um, I think the very idea of uh, the field has been challenged, in particular when the pandemic hit. So um, Resulting from this, um, one of the key questions amongst others that we asked ourselves in our class um, also referred to the yeah, use or increased use of um, digital tools, for example, that many of us um, had to rely on um, by using social media or online service, et cetera, for um, the data collection, for example, for our final thesis project. And um, we often wondered whether this tension also um, would result in more maybe or even less power asymmetries related to field work. And um, yeah, one uh, key takeaway or one takeaway is that me and my fellow students also engaged or at least were part of this um, these tensions, um, I would say, and also started to rethink a bit um, what the field means and our approach and roles as researchers and also future development practitioners. And yeah, in this context, also, um, yeah, issues of how we are reproducing knowledge, ethical questions, and really self reflective processes also um, have been part of these tensions, I would say. And um, one attempt also to bring the field in a way to the university, um, especially in 2020, um, was a student led debate platform we initiated called Dilemmas of Development. And here we try to bring together students with development practitioners and with the aim to ask and discuss also uncomfortable questions um, of development work. And here I would like to highlight maybe one panel debate that we organized in which we really try to bridge or bring together um, the theory and practice and also discuss, for example, um, approaches of decolonization of research, issues of social and ecological justice. So, and I think with this format, for example, students could engage in discussions that would not necessarily come up during regular seminars or lectures in the classroom. And I think this was, yeah, a very insightful journey, especially in the time of the pandemic. So, yeah, that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, the next thing we'd like to discuss are the methods, tools, and pedagogies we're using in our classroom. And because we're running a little bit behind, I'm proposing that just Nathan speaks to this theme and then we move on to give enough space to talk about the challenges that we've been facing. So I hope that's okay with the group. Um, Nathan, go ahead. Okay. Um, that's fine. One of the exciting uh, new models that was developed by um, the MDP program at the University of Minnesota um, was a podcast project. And this podcast project uh, tried to marry two of the central concepts within the MDP program of both practice and theory. Um, and so you've heard a lot from my colleagues talking about, thinking about the ways in which knowledge is created and reproduced. Um, and so the first part of the podcast theory was really a series of journals by individuals within the core MDP class to think about their own positionality a bunch of, along a bunch of different axes. So positionality in terms of race, gender, sexual orientation, and thinking about how those identities um, 
make themselves apparent in the way that they view the world and the way that they create and distribute knowledge in the world. And then the second part of the project was really uh, to, to think uh, creatively about a podcast project in which you interview a fellow classmate about their theory of change for the world and the way in which um, their theory of change is influenced by uh, their various identities and their positionality in the world. Um, and this, this, at least for me, this podcast project was extremely helpful in thinking about uh, the Western gaze and thinking about the ways in which we uh, as development practitioners um, bring and are encumbered by our various identities in the work that we do. Um, and then also thinking about the craft of how it is that you, uh, you share someone else's story, which is, I think, an integral part of a lot of what happens in the development field and also a incredibly fraught activity a lot of the time. Um, and so this podcast project really helped marry both uh, praxis and theory in a unique way that was incredibly fruitful for me and for a variety of my peers. Um, yeah. Thanks, Nathan. So moving on to the last part of our discussion, we wanted to have some space to talk um, very openly about some challenges that we faced. Um, and reflect on those dilemmas, those discomforts, those tensions that accompany us on this journey. Um, so two of the themes that have emerged from our conversation are those related to institutional challenges in trying to um, promote this decolonizing agenda within our programs. And then also to um, a challenge um, we spoke of earlier of the expectations that students have coming into our program. What, what they think they're going to learn um, what their expectations are for getting jobs and how that sometimes can be in tension with um, these larger um, reflective exercises about what decolonizing means. So I'd like to just give everybody a chance to um, weigh in on either of those that you want to talk about. Lonry, would you like to get us started? Okay, that's fine. Um, what the biggest issue when it comes to challenges is the mindset that students bring into the program. Uh, when a student comes to the program, just like you said, uh, because of the expectations they have uh, about job prospects, about where they currently work, and how whatever they learn is going to import uh, into that. So it then becomes a challenge for the faculties in trying to direct the mindsets about the structure and nature of development that is not straight jacketed that needs some that has been uh, a, a result of some sort of colonization uh, and as if we want to understand development in the way it should then the mind itself has to be decolonized so that, that's the first thing and it's a serious challenge for many of the faculties trying to uh, make sure that the students bring this out. The second issue of challenge has to do with the uh, curriculum development and approval in the university, especially the University of Ibadan, where we have. Uh, there is a very uh, strict rule about what you can change, what you can teach, how you can teach, and things like that. And as a result, it takes a longer process trying to include certain aspects into the curriculum. Yeah, for example, the before in the last many years ago, we were not used to this uh, multidisciplinary approach into different courses. So it then becomes difficult to bring issues of uh, culture and civilization and indigenous knowledge approach to development, which are compulsory courses in our program uh, to a course like um, the development practice. So the faculty, I mean, those of us in charge of Master's in development practice needed to uh, really argue on why issues of culture, civilization, indigenous knowledge and practices uh, should be a compulsory course. Uh, but of course, these are the courses that will lead to the colonization of the mind and the decolonization of the thoughts that the uh, students will have. The third aspect of that also has to do with the faculties who are handling the courses. Uh, the faculties who are to teach the students also have 
to be selected carefully. Uh, because like I said, the issue of colonization, decolonization and post-colonization are mindset issues. Uh, and there are people who need to have this change of mindset. So the faculty who has to teach it must be someone who understands that mindset and is also available to uh, thinking broadly about these issues. So these are the three basic uh, problems that I think, uh, three basic challenges that I think we have. And over the years, we have been able to overcome uh, many of them. Thank you. Thank you, Henri. Mariel, would you like to go? I see we have 15 minutes left, don't we? And to be honest, I feel like you and Lanry have really covered everything that's also come up from Lun. So I would be happy to open uh, the space up. Sorab, would you like to go? Yeah, so, um, so one basic problem that we are facing in terms of our um, decolonial uh, met research methodology. So that's the major challenges that we are facing right now. And also uh, we are facing the challenge on the pedagogy. So I uh, and our few faculty members who were coming from sociology, anthropology background, and our faculty members are very diverse in nature. One is from rural development, and is from economics, and is from management studies. So they have very different mindsets. So what Landry is trying to point out that uh, the problem with the faculty members mindset is one of the major hurdles for us. Even I want to promote the colonial pedagogical system, but other faculty members sometimes they do not. So this mindset needs to be changed. So we are trying to do this. So, but at the same time, we uh, found also that uh, the participation of the students, which initial I mean, and the class participation, what I call, it's a bit of a bigger challenge. So we uh, largely followed the model like unlearning and learning, relearning, reflections and evaluations. So uh, we started with that model initially and we uh, used a lot of uh, methods like experiential learning, storytelling, case studies, critical debates, documentary film analysis and documentary film making. Okay, so uh, say uh, we are given a uh, separate mail to the student like, uh, we have, uh, if, if you, uh, if some kind of, uh, they are, tomorrow they are going for field work uh, for next 25 days. So we requested them if, if they can do, uh, uh, it's not mandatory, but it is a voluntary, but I'm going to make it mandatory in the program review that you have to make a documentary film uh, with the grassroots engagements and how we are engaging with the, uh, and what are the problems that, the, uh, uh, that you think it needs to be highlighted in, in the film itself. So I share one, well, my last thing that uh, it was a storytelling, which I found a lot of problems. So India is a very diverse country. We know that we have issues with the class, caste, gender. So these issues needs, I thought initially that it needs to be highlighted, but I faced a lot of challenges during the class. So I asked one of my students and students from uh, Afghanistan, uh, you know, who shared his experience, how he faced terrorism uh, during, uh, uh, during uh, you know, summer in 2006 and seven, because he's quite uh, elder now. And, um, and he, how, how, how he faced the, you know, terrorism during his childhood and how that actually helped to come off uh, a kind of mindset. And, and he shared his uh, experience in the class to, which actually enlightened our students that because our students were not very well aware of uh, the Talibs and other groups. So for the first time, we got to know about uh, our kind of live experience. So another example, one of our students, uh, he sh uh, shared his experience because he is uh, uh, the margin from the marginalized communities that we call the schedule caste or Dalit community. So he shared his challenges while getting uh, jobs in private job market. So our pedagogy is not about the sharing the content and textbook, but providing the study materials and it is about the cultivate the decolonial consciousness. So I, I face the challenge because a lot of students resist. Okay, so, so we are trying to incorporate, uh, you know, some curriculum in the program review, which is currently going on, a kind of compulsory work where we can actually highlight our 
uh, you know, pedagogical system more efficiently. So that challenge number one is the pedagogy that we are facing. And challenge number two is that uh, how we are going to deal with the faculty mindset. So these two challenges we face. Okay, this is from my side. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Emily. Nathan, did you have something you want to add? Yeah, just really quickly, I would say that um, as, a, as a current student, you know, I think one of the perspectives that I would offer is that we talk a lot about pedagogical change and methods change and field experience change. Um, and those are all really important things. Uh, to be striving for, but I think as, as a current student and from what I hear from my peers, there is this underlying tension between the theory that we're learning in school and the way that that will materialize itself out in the real world when we're applying for jobs and when we are, when we are moving to the next stage of life um, where the theory hits the road, um, to use that expression. Um, and I think that is a that is a tension that we have to wrestle with and um, and also latent within that is also the question of how is it that we um, we critique the systems that uh, that exist within the development field, but also give people enough hope that they uh, continue to want to uh, work within the field and work to change the field. Um, yeah. Thanks, Nathan. I think everybody's hit on some of the main challenges. That one about balancing the critique and the hope is, is hard. And one that the students struggle with and we struggle with too in, in terms of teachers. Just before we get to the questions, one thing I wanted to mention that our, our group has also reflected on it are the different layers of privilege that each of us is bringing to this discussion and our ability to decolonize in our, in our programs, in our universities. Um, how we're working in very different histories and institutional contexts. We have different resources and time. Um, and there's some members of our team that aren't even able to talk about these ideas openly for fear of government reprisal. So that's something to always reflect on when we think about what this looks like in different parts of the world, those different layers of privilege. So I wanna have some room for questions. So. Let's um, look at those now. I don't know if anyone's been looking at them more closely than me who wants to jump into one of these. The last one I see, maybe let, we can go to this one. Um, could the students, Nathan and Donya, talk more about resistance among their peers to decolonization? Maybe that, speaking to that tension that you talked about, Nathan. Sonia, um, do you, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I think uh, as has been said by a variety of different folks, people come to international development programs and the MDP program for a wide variety of different reasons. Um, and that's just a reality. Um, and I think there are people who are really interested in engaging in decolonization and then there are also people who are more than happy to fit within the neoliberal framework that development supports a lot of the time. Um, I think what has been helpful for me is thinking about the classroom as a creative space for co-creating new ways of thinking about some of these issues and a strength of a diverse program is that you have and the strength of a program that encourages trust uh, within the cohort is that you have the freedom to talk about some of these extremely difficult subjects and co-create some new knowledge together. Thanks, Nathan. Donna, would you like to add to that? Mm, maybe one more sentence. Um, also what I felt sometimes that um, some students are not necessarily seeing decolonization as part of a wider system so um and also maybe not as um, or not seen related to neoliberal terms politic as a political project etc so um yeah maybe this is also something um that students or, or 
answers the question why students might not engage as much. Yeah. Thanks, Donia. Um, I think we have a question from Hillary. Thanks to all of you. This has been a really fabulous session. One question that I wanted to ask as in our program, one of the things that I have noticed is that as we make curricular changes that kind of match up with pedagogical changes, that I am working on trying to figure out how to communicate to students in the program, the sort of nested learning objectives that come out of, um, yeah, changes to specific assignments and sort of exploring what is that an example of, right, <laughs> in terms of their overall learning trajectory through the two years in our program. And part of what I hear from you all is the way that changes to actual course materials and to the ways that you are approaching field experience, right, are designed to, um, to, to make all those changes in how, stu how students learn in addition to what they are learning. And I wondered if you could talk about um, how open or how much conversation there is about that process, right? So sort of like orienting them to the meta task um, in, a, in an explicit way. Anyone want to take that one on? Yeah, so I have one point to explain what Riku was trying to point. Hi, Riku. So your point is very valid, I think. Uh, uh, we are currently having that the discussion that we are having that is neo-colonial courses versus decolonial courses. <laughs> That's the challenge we are having. And the one way we have a neo-colonial set of courses uh, on entrepreneurship development based on some job market. Another way we are having the cultural ecology, political ecology and so so we have to actually, we're trying to balance it out. So that's the one biggest challenge is across the world because we cannot deny West. We have to take West into consideration. And we also cannot uh, take West, uh, take the, uh, our curriculum for granted so that, uh, you know, our curriculum should be based mix of both East and West. So the major challenges that we face, that uh, the denial, so the more we deny, more I think uh, we are not reflect reflecting. So our reflection is very important. So, so one question that Iriko, you are trying to point out here in terms of uh, the participatory tool. Yes, it is right. You are right. But at the same time, uh, current uh, program review structure, we are trying to incorporate uh, ethnography, a short ethnography, uh, to, for for uh, you know, the students, which actually mandates them to reflect, especially the reflexive anthropology, because I'm from anthropology. And I try to incorporate, I, it is very difficult for me, my faculty members, to make them understand that this reflexivity is so important, because they are coming from economics, they are coming from uh, science background, you know, so it's very difficult. So that challenges we are facing. But at the same time, I would say that I, from my course, what I'm teaching research methodology, and I purposefully incorporate uh, a short ethnography, say five or six months of courses, I uh, in introduce ethnography where they can at least conduct uh, a kind of field work as well as they can make a reflection of those. So reflexivity is one mm -hmm. of the most important point in my thing. So that's what I can say with you. Thank you very much for your questions. Just to contribute to that, I, I think in our program, we are very explicit about saying that this is our approach and this is kind of our strategy, how, how we're operationalizing this in each class. So we talk about that during orientation. And then we have our, um, our class surveys and then an end of the year survey where students are asked specific questions to kind of assess um, how they feel the the class is going, but they're very specifically aimed at these decolonizing objectives. And then we reflect on that as a group and talk about where we want to go. So I think that's um, being just very explicit from the beginning gets the students. We, we really don't have very much pushback in the direction of resistance. But create, creating that openness, I think, from the start means that students feel comfortable emailing me and saying, like, you forgot this big thing, you said this wrong, here's a reading you really need to include. So certainly get plenty of push in that direction. We haven't really had a lot of resistance in our program to this approach. 
I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything else before we conclude. Well, well, let me just add this before we conclude that for the Masters in Development Practice Program, we also have this joint course that we take that most of the uh, programs take, which is called the Global Classroom, uh, where uh, faculties from different areas, from different regions of the world, uh, teach and the students learn together. Uh, this has been a collaborative teaching and learning process that Ibadan, uh, our students at Ibadan have benefited from extensively because of the interaction that it provides. Thank you. Thanks, Mario, did you have a final point? Mm, no, I just wanted to point out that in Lume's case, I think what makes a big difference also, it's, it's that it's quite a high stake program. It's one of the most competitive programs of the University of Lund, which means there is a lot of um, attention as to what the program is doing, which makes it also a bit more difficult, I think, to, to steer in, in any one direction. Uh, so I think that sort of context in which a program is situated might also make a difference as to what room for maneuver you have as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank everybody for tuning in. Um, we are working on co-publishing co a paper around these same themes. So hopefully we can share that with you next year. Awesome. Thank you all so much for this really rich um, conversation and for sharing both what you're doing as well as the challenges that you're facing in it. I think it was really, really great. Um, and yes, definitely share that paper with us when it's ready.